Well, welcome to or welcome back to the 510 Report where we talk about industry news, advocacy, and general goings on. This video today is a part two of two. So what I'm gonna do is link down in the description to part one of this series. I would highly, highly suggest watching that video before you jump into this video. And before we jump into this video, I do have to give one more huge thank you to Danielle Jones, without whom this would not be possible. So once Big Pharma has the science that they want, which again, all of this was discussed in the first episode. But after they have the science that they want, what do they need next? How about the support of widely trusted and supposedly objective organizations that are only supposed to care about public health? Because if you get those types of groups on board, it legitimizes the science no matter how controversial it is. Big Pharma pays for the support and endorsements of trusted and respected NGOs and nonprofits like the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, the American Medical Association. In 1996, the American Cancer Society signed a multi-million dollar deal with big pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline. They are the US sellers of Nicorette and Nicoderm CQ. And the deal was fairly simple. The American Cancer Society sold GlaxoSmithKline the rights to use its logo on packaging and advertisements in exchange for millions of dollars. The American Lung Association did the same thing with Johnson & Johnson, the makers of the Nicotrol patch. And these are not exactly isolated incidents. This is a major source of funding for these organizations. The American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, the American Medical Association, essentially any nonprofit healthcare organization has done this same exact thing for money. And the ironic thing is that they insist that they do not actually support these products. Now, you can imagine how confusing this is going to be for the consumer, which is why there have been multiple multi-million dollar lawsuits against the pharmaceutical companies for these misleading advertising tactics. Another trusted advocacy group that we all might be familiar with is the Campaign for Tobacco tobacco-free kids. This group has been extremely vocal in its anti-vaping sentiments and is considered trustworthy by the general public because their only goal is to protect the kids. But just to play devil's advocate in this situation, let's question their motives a little bit. The group was created by and funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in 1995, along with the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association. To date, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which which again is the foundation of pharmaceutical giant Johnson & Johnson, has poured over $121 million into its own creation. Big Pharma has also managed to buy the support of even larger institutions, like for example, the National Institute of Health. The NIH is the primary agency of the US government for researching public health. In 2008, an NIH expert panel released guidelines that recommended that every single small smoker in the United States be treated with pharmaceuticals only, as in gums, patches, inhalers, lozenges, shantix. This panel advised against quitting cold turkey or any other method. Why would they do this? Well, because nine of the expert panel's members received money from big pharmaceuticals who make and manufacture the products that the panel exclusively recommended. Of course. Now in the last 510 report, we talked about how Big Pharma buys the science that they need. And today we're gonna step forward into legislation. This is the last truly scary piece of the puzzle that actually initiates the change that impacts our everyday lives. Since campaign contributions are public record, it's not difficult to see that Big Pharma has paid multiple politicians for anti-vaping opinions and policies. Take for example, former Senator Ted Lautenberg from New New Jersey who received over $400,000 from pharma industry groups. He was one of the first senators to speak out against vaping in 2008, which is coincidentally the year he received the largest sum of money from them 
$141,000. And during that time period, the average donation from a pharmaceutical industry group to a politician was only right around $15,000. And Massachusetts Senator Ed Markley was quoted as saying that electronic cigarettes should be put out of business. And was the senator responsible for urging the Department of Transportation to ban vapor products on airplanes in 2014? He himself has accepted a lifetime total of over $440,000 from Big Pharma, with the biggest spike in, that's right, 2014. Other anti-vaping Senate Democrats like Sherrod Brown from Ohio, Senator Richard Blumenthal from Connecticut, have very similar patterns, receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars from Big Pharma. But because campaign contributions are regularly scrutinized, Big Pharma has another avenue for influencing policy, one that they can dump millions of dollars into without anybody noticing. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the foundation of pharmaceutical giant Johnson & Johnson has given over $22 million to a company called Change Lab Solutions out of Oakland, California. California, as we have all seen, has been hit with some of the harshest anti-vaping laws in the United States. Even just a quick look at the Change Lab Solutions website, which will be linked to down below in the description so you can see this for yourself, reveals an entire section of the site dedicated to misleading anti-vaping information. As well as numerous documents and how-to guides on passing legislation to restrict or ban vapor products, including pre-written drafts of bills for legislators to use. And if you compare their drafts to the actual bills that were proposed and passed in cities and counties in California, you'll find entire sections that are copied just word for word from these Change Lab Solution documents. One of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's recent grants to Change Lab Solutions in the amount of $4 million is titled Supporting Change Lab Solutions in Developing Law and Policy Tools to Build Healthy, Equitable Communities for Children and Families. And the really bizarre thing is that these 501c3 organizations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation are prohibited by the government from attempting to support or influence legislation. It even says so on the foundation's own website. And of course, we can't forget about the CDC. The Affordable Care Act created a multi-billion dollar slush fund called the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which is controlled by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uses this money to give grants through the CDC using a program called Communities Putting Prevention to Work. The CDC encouraged and allowed grant recipients to use the money to lobby for state and local policy changes, including increasing taxes on tobacco, smoke-free policies, taxes on sugary beverages. But why should we care about any of this? Well, for one, lobbying using federal funds like this is actually illegal. But because at that time, it was a democratic program under a democratic president with a democratic attorney general, no action was taken against the CDC except for one warning. One of these cases involved the California Department of Public Health using a $2.2 million grant to lobby for legislation removing sugary beverages from public schools in California. We're all familiar with the California Department of Public Health. They are the ones responsible for the still blowing smoke campaign. Another case involved a CPPW advisory council at the Boston Public Health Commission advising the mayor on the dangers of electronic cigarettes in 2011. That same year, they passed a ban on all public use of vapor products and e-cigs. There is also the people in powerful positions that they pay to push anti-vaping agendas for them. For example, former FDA director Dr. Robert Califf accepted money from almost every big pharma organization with a smoking cessation product on the market, including Johnson & Johnson and GlaxoSmithKline. Or what about chief tobacco regulator at the FDA, Mitch Zeller, who wrote the 2009 Tobacco Control Act while actively lobbying for and being a consultant of GlaxoSmithKline. Just shocking conflicts of interest. But if all of that isn't convincing enough, the last thing that we're going to do is look at a document entitled Six Innovations in Building Consumer Demand for Tobacco Cessation Products and Services. This PDF, which is available online, was written by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and was published by the National Tobacco Cessation Collaborative, which is funded by the American Cancer Society, the CDC, as well as Pfizer, GlaxoSmithKline, and the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. The fourth strategy 
strategy laid out in this document is called seizing policy changes as opportunities for breakthrough increases in treatment use and quit rates. In this section, they recommend tobacco control policy interventions, including increasing prices and increasing taxes. It says that smoking bans increase quit rates and demand for their quit smoking treatments. They reference stimulating and harnessing the treatment demand generated by tobacco control policy changes and encourage the passing of legislation to ban smoking or raise taxes in combination with marketing campaigns for their NRT products, their quit smoking aids in order to increase this demand and thus sales for their pharmaceutical products. This is all very compelling evidence of big pharma and the science that they pay for and the supporters that they pay all colluding to change the laws for the sole purpose of increasing demand and increasing sales of their pharmaceutical quit smoking NRT products. The same products that as we mentioned before have a very low success rate and result in smokers continuing to smoke, continuing to get sick, and continuing to die from smoking related illnesses. So now we know the truth. While Big Tobacco does continue to sell products that kill us, it's big pharmaceuticals that have inserted themselves into every facet of this epidemic, keeping the machine running. And regardless of whether smokers live or die, Big Pharma still makes a profit. They purchase the science that says that vaping is bad. They buy the support of trusted nonprofits so that nobody can question the science. And they buy the legislation to ban and the competition and increase their own sales. It's a perverse system of money and power and vaping is interrupting all of that. So how does this end? What can we do? Be disruptive. Encourage smokers to quit smoking and switch to vaping. Spread awareness. Spread information. Be vigilant. Stand up for the rights of vapors and those actually trying to end the smoking epidemic. Contradict the lies any chance you can and don't give attention and page views to these news outlets spreading this misinformation. Boycott consumer products made by these big pharmaceutical companies and support vape companies and advocacy groups that are actually trying to make a difference. Register to vote. Make your voice heard. Show up at hearings. Follow those calls to actions. Stay informed. The struggle is real. Our enemy is strong, but the fight is in our hands. And I do believe that science in the end will prevail. Literally, a billion lives depend on it. And that is where we're going to be ending the 510 report this week. As always, I would love to get any of your feedback down in the comments below. And we're not going to end this 510 report without also mentioning kasa.org. Go and sign up. It's free. It's easy. All you need is an email. If you ever want to know about possible upcoming bad or negative vape legislation happening in your particular city, state, or area, join Kasa. Kasa.org. Follow the calls to action. We have got a long, long way to go, my friends. And as Kevin Skipper used to say, you don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Let's get involved.